Hello, I'm Alex Moset, and welcome to Winner Take All. I'm really excited to have with us a special guest today, Andrew Wilkinson, calling into us from Canada. He's a famed tech investor. He's an entrepreneur. He uh, now has a public company. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Really wonderful to have you. Great to be here, Alex. I'm a uh, big fan of your book and uh, excited to be here. That means worlds to me, especially as as a guy who knows who actually owns you know, uh, uh, just one or two uh, platform companies of, of your own there. Been really looking forward to having you on the show and just getting to know more about, you know, how you think about investing and, and some of your story. With, with the most recent thing, most recent kind of event, or I guess your, your first kind of, you know, public company IPO event would be WeCommerce. Could you you know, why don't you start us off there? What is WeCommerce? How did all that come about? It's, it's, you know, it's only been around since 2019. A really amazing story. Yeah. So I'm uh, based in Canada. I live on the West Coast uh, over in Victoria. And uh, about 15 years ago, I started a design agency. And uh, I happened to be at a conference and I met uh, Harley and Toby from Shopify. Um, so this would have been in about 2009 or 2010. And at the time, Shopify was just a small bootstrapped company. Uh, they were based in Canada too. And so we got to know each other a little bit. And they said, look, we've got this problem. We have um, all these merchants using our uh, our platform, but they all want custom design. And so we really want to have uh, a diverse set of um, templates. We want people to be able to log into the Shopify platform and choose from, you know, twenty or thirty different um, designs. And we want you guys to be our first partner on that. And so we kind of said, oh, well, you know, we're a little busy running this agency, but we'll do these guys a favor. They seem really nice. They're fellow Canadians, and uh, we launched a few themes on their platform. And the neat thing about what they did is they created a marketplace. So anyone could create a theme and then you could charge between 50 and $250 um, for a merchant to use your theme. And so we did that and it kind of, uh, you know, within uh, two years or three years, we started doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a month in revenue. Um, and it just kind of took off and we never would have predicted this, but we, um, you know, we were a barnacle on a whale. And as Shopify became the dominant platform for independent e-commerce, uh, we continued to benefit. Um, but we made a critical mistake, which is in 2013, we actually sold that business. Uh, at the time, I was kind of overwhelmed. My business partner and I were running uh, five or six different businesses. And we ended up selling that company um, to a family office. And we stayed on the board. We kept 20%. And kind of passively watch from the sidelines. And around that time, I came into a bunch of money because I'd sold my business. And so I said, well, I need to start understanding investing. And so I started reading books about great investors. And the first book that I picked up was uh, The Making of an American Capitalist, the book about Warren Buffett. And when I read about Buffett, uh, I read about moats. And when I read about moats, you know, I realized that we actually had a business with a moat. We had a dominant position on a platform. And over time, uh, you know, we had we had gotten to a point where we had a very large uh, market share and it was difficult to to join because building a theme took quite a bit of time. And so, you know, the business was actually um, you know, very, very exceptional and I regretted selling it. And so I watched from the sidelines um, you know, as the business continued to grow. And uh, ultimately, really developed a thesis around Shopify um, becoming the dominant player in independent e-commerce. And eventually, I ended up approaching the board of the business and saying, "Look, I'd like to buy the company back." So I sucked it up. I paid something like five times what they had paid me, and uh, I acquired Pixel Union, that original theme business. And at the time I did that, we ended up creating a holding company. Called WeCommerce, which uh, we wanted to focus around acquiring the top players in the Shopify ecosystem. So, Shopify ecosystem is um, apps, themes, and services. And we started acquiring a variety of businesses in that space. Um, and in December, we ended up taking that business public. 
on the Toronto Venture Stock Exchange up here in Canada. And uh, now for five months, we've had a public company. So lots of learnings, but overall, it's been a great experience. That's great. I was I was going to ask you, I, I was thinking, oh, that must be Pixel Union. But I didn't realize that you had started that, sold it, and then bought it back. But it seemed to me that just just based upon what you do in Tiny, which you know we'll get to here in a second, I was like, what was the anchor for WeCommerce? And and so okay, so that makes sense. That helps fill in some of the gaps for me. Bring it full circle then on WeCommerce is technically technically WeCommerce started in 2019, but you could also say that it started with Pixel Union many 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 years prior. And then this one was really interesting, where I I think. With your other deals, you know, you 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 don't have a, um, a formal fund. You don't have a bunch of LPs. But in in the WeCommerce commerce model, you did bring in some outside investors. You did do kind of like a rapid, you know, roll up. I guess of I guess actually, let me take that back. Rapid for you, um, it's rapid for other people. It's not rapid for you. It's just what you've been doing at Tiny. But you you bought a, a handful of other businesses, packaged that up into a model which seems very similar to Tiny and what you just have been doing for many years anyway bundled these up put them in a you know in in a in a sequence that's all around Shopify and that was essentially the the SPAC or what is it, an RTO it's the Canadian version of of a SPAC that you did a handful of months ago is that right like what did i miss in that How, what are the gaps there i would say it's quite different from a SPAC um, so in Canada, the most popular way to go public for small companies is a rever- reverse takeover. And it's similar to a SPAC in that you're you're basically merging into a shell corporation with some capital in it. The difference is that it's a very small amount of capital. So where a SPAC might have 100 to 500 million sitting in it, uh, a shell corp might have you know 300K in it or 500K. Um, so the dilution hit you take is minor and essentially it's a trade off. You say, look, I can go public in three months instead of five months. I don't have to do a roadshow. You know, it's very similar in many ways. Um, and the costs that you would otherwise incur doing a traditional IPO are actually quite similar to the dilutionary hit that you take by merging into the art into the um, shell corp. So for us, just speed to market was really worthwhile um, and it worked out well for us. Um, but it wasn't a SPAC. You know, a SPAC kind of comes with a lot of connotations around taking, you know, a 20% dilutionary hit and, uh, you know, taking in a bunch of kind of aggressive money and projections and stuff. I'd say it's really not that. At the end of the day, um, you know, you look at the way Berkshire has evolved, they have different verticals that they have kind of started to um, build almost mini holding companies uh, within. So like Berkshire Hathaway Energy or the insurance businesses, for example, where they have a you know a leader at the top who's also allocating capital within that group. And I would say we're just doing the same thing. So um, at the end of the day, we saw a vertical in Shopify that was so attractive that we felt that it deserved its own holding company. Um, and because of the opportunity that we saw, we said, look, it's really logical for us to go out and raise additional capital because we want to move uh, quickly and strike while the iron's hot with a very large elephant gun. And so, um, you know, we raised $60 million in the IPO uh, and we've been deploying it aggressively into a variety of acquisitions. We actually just closed uh, a deal in the last month. Uh, we bought a company called Stamp, which is one of the top ratings and reviews players on Shopify. And this is part of your normal deal making process, right? Where it's start to finish in four weeks, you're completing these acquisitions in in basically a month's time. Is that right? So we try to do, I mean, it really comes down to the founder. So some founders are like me. I mean, honestly, the, the whole tiny process is really designed about around my personal experience dealing with private equity. And when I owned, uh, you know, just five businesses back when I would, you know, sell businesses or look at selling businesses more frequently, we would get approached by private equity and it would be a six to eight month miserable dance that it required tons of in-person visits and flying all over the place and wasting time on financial models and stuff before actually talking about the meat and potatoes of the deal. And I always just wanted the private equity firm to say, look, send me your financials. We'll send you an offer. Right. And that's what we try and do. Um, and, and really reading about Berkshire made me realize that 
yes, this is possible. And there's a reason they do the dance. And there's two primary reasons they do the dance. One, they're they're fiduciaries. They need to tick boxes and stuff. Um, Number two is it's negotiation. So they often can give you, you know, a very attractive looking deal. And then over the course of six months, they pick apart your business. They, uh, you know, renegotiate all the terms and it turns into something that it wasn't contemplated. And often founders are so exhausted by the end of it that they just go along with it. I said, you know, I'd love to do what Buffett does and just basically have someone share their numbers. Uh, I'll tell them, you know, whether or not uh, their asking price makes sense. And if it does, then we'll try and close the deal in 30 days. And sometimes, you know, lawyers get involved and founders like to um, kind of take more time getting to know us and stuff. Other times people want to sell businesses in two weeks and uh, we're happy to kind of go with the buyer. You know, when you get down to brass tacks and Shouldn't take months and months and months to figure these things out. So let's go to, you know, what where you where you started many years ago, which was Meta Lab, and there's a great um, tweet thread that you have uh, where you talk about. This is a story about how I lost ten million dollars by doing something stupid. Uh, ten dot million dot dollars that uh literally up in smoke money bonfire and uh and then you have a great thread talking about the ins and outs of what happened here but you know take us in the way back machine andrew you know what was metal lab how did flow like how did you kind of get going to even just get to the point of tiny which which we're going to talk about here i promise but you know how, how did this all start um, way, way, way back. So I'm not one of those kids who love business in high school and, you know, had lemonade stands and all that stuff. I thought business was a boring thing that my dad bought home, brought home in a briefcase looking dejected. You know, I had no interest. Um, I, I basically, uh, stumbled into it. Um, so I, when I was in high school, I started a tech news site Um, Just kind of for fun, I was learning how to build websites. And to be totally honest, I wanted to try and get companies to send me free products. So, you know, at the time, there's all these websites that reviewed technology products and uh, Logitech and Apple and all the big tech companies would send them stuff. So I started this website and started posting um, news that I'd write myself with, you know, other um, teenage nerds who had met on the internet. And to my surprise, it actually took off and we started getting tons of advertising and uh, got to travel to um, Macworld and interview Steve Jobs and had all these amazing experiences in in high school. And I kind of like to joke that I got my MBA in high school because I pretty much skipped high school and managed a team of writers and, you know, developers and stuff and started negotiating um, deals back when I was, you know, 16. So I started really young and, uh, the, the big kind of misfire was when I graduated high school, I said, well, I guess I'm doing journalism. So I'll go to journalism school. And what I didn't realize was I actually loved business. I loved you know, building a business, building a team, doing deals, all that kind of stuff. I just didn't really register that as an option or what I was doing. And so I went to journalism school And on day one, they kind of sat us down and said, hey, we're going to prepare you over the next four years to go write for one of the big papers. And I'm just going, newspapers, you know, this is 2004, but it was very obvious newspapers were dead and that I was learning an antiquated craft. And so I dropped out after a few months uh, and kind of had an existential crisis trying to figure out what to do. And I ended up deciding after reading a book about Google that I wanted to move to Silicon Valley seemed like uh, there was just so much exciting stuff happening down there, but I was dead broke. And so I said, okay, well, maybe I'll sell my design services. You know, I know how to build websites. Um, Maybe I'll freelance and just kind of make enough money that I can move down to Silicon Valley and then I'll go get a job. And I started looking around on all these uh, job board websites and finding all these freelance gigs, but I realized that I was competing with agencies. And so I, made myself look like an agency. I came up with the name Meta Lab, designed a really nice looking website, and I started calling startup founders. And fortunately, um, I'd been selling ads for my website for the last five years. So I knew how to talk on the phone 
and negotiate and kind of pitch myself. And I ended up closing, you know, 20 or $30,000 of work in the first couple of months. And before I knew it, I was thinking, well, geez, why would I ever move to Silicon Valley? I can make a killing selling, uh, you know, the same services I would otherwise be doing as an employee, all these startups um, down there, I get to meet all these interesting people and work on a much higher level. And so I started doing that. And within about five years, I had Apple and Walmart and Google as clients um, and had grown it very significantly. And I had a really great problem, which was I had profits and I didn't really know what to do with those profits. And so um, I'd always romanticized the idea of owning a software company you know, running an agency, you're always two months away from bankruptcy where you never know where your next dollar is coming from. And the idea of recurring revenue was kind of magic to me. And so I started uh, a variety of SaaS software businesses, um, you know, initially just to kind of help me run the agency. So project management software, invoicing and estimate software, time tracking software. And um, those were, you know, my first taste of recurring revenue, it was pretty magical to go to sleep and wake up and have made $200 while I slept. Um, so I got totally addicted to this idea of building out more and more businesses. Um, and I kind of stumbled into investing. What ended up happening is um, we got big enough that we had excess cash and I just couldn't keep starting companies. It wasn't sustainable. Uh, I wasn't doing a very good job of running five or six companies at once. And so I said, well, I've got to start buying businesses and doing more passive investing. Um, and when I read about Buffett, I just realized that I could actually delegate all this to CEOs. And so we separated all the businesses. Uh, we handed the reins to CEOs. And, and when that happened, we realized that the businesses could grow much faster without uh, us trying to split ourselves across all of them. Um, and so for the last seven years, I've been buying businesses, hiring great CEOs um, and uh, letting them do their thing and just kind of leaving them alone. And all of our businesses are unique in that they're technology companies that are actually profitable. So we don't focus on flashy metrics. We don't do anything cutting edge. We really focus on building profitable, sustainable technology businesses. You're buying what some might say are boring profitable internet companies, right? They, they're not threatened. It, it's not the, you know, we're, we're going to be a unicorn. And that means that if we're, we're going after this unicorn, we got to get a bunch of VC money and a tech monopoly is either going to buy us or try to, you know, copy us or um, destroy us or some mixture of all three. But you're buying businesses that are sustainable, that you can invest in and you can give them a lot of autonomy. They're not even joining Tiny with the prospect of, you know, oh, there's a bunch of synergies between the portfolio. That's also the Buffett model, right? It's you give them autonomy, they stay in their own lane and you just give them advice when they want it. And, you know, you have a good eye uh, and are a good and patient investor is another thing you talk a lot about. Um, and, and so, you know, that's where Tiny started. Now Tiny has, I think, over 35 businesses. And I guess... Your version of Buffett's insurance companies that were spinning off capital was, or still is to some degree, you know, your, your services business, the, uh, you know, your agency model here, which was generating these profits. And then you, obviously you started things like Pixel and then sold that off. And you also got capital from that, which you were able to, I guess, invest in other areas. And, and that's some of how you got the initial capital for Tiny. Is, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so we never, uh, we never until uh, we did WeCommerce, we never raised an outside, uh, any outside capital, and we bootstrapped absolutely everything. And that's not because we were opposed to raising capital. It was we didn't know, we didn't know venture investors. There's no no private equity firms approaching us uh, in the early days. We couldn't get uh, even bank debt. Canadian banks are very conservative. We could barely get credit cards, let alone a business loan. And so at the end of the day, we just had to become incredibly disciplined P&L investors. And we didn't know how good our businesses was. We didn't know that it was special to have you know 40% uh, net profit margins until we started looking at other businesses. And we realized that oh my God, there's all these people running technology businesses like Cowboys and just burning money endlessly. 
And you don't have to do that. You know, there's this third door where you can run sustainably and you can still grow very fast while also being profitable. Um, and so that's kind of the lens that we look through. And most technology investors, especially at the kind of um, you know, 10 to $50 million revenue scale, um, they don't think about profits much. They think about how do we become, you know, the next unicorn. And that's not, just not our thing. You know, I joke that we do boring businesses. I don't really mean boring. I just mean we're not doing drones and VR and AR and stuff. We're doing the kind of mom and pop main street businesses of the internet. It's great to be able to kind of carve out your own territory uh, where the VCs aren't interested because they're the TAM isn't big enough, where the tech monopolies aren't interested similarly because the TAM isn't big enough. So you're kind of under the radar, right? Totally. And also, I mean, we do have businesses that are, you know, pretty sizable scale, um, but they've gotten to a point where they're difficult to disrupt, right? So you look at Dribble, you took a billion dollars and Microsoft decided they wanted to create a Dribble competitor. It could be really hard. I think as long as we treat that community well, there's tremendous uh, network effect and platform lock in. Um, so, you know, that's an example of a business that's now, you know, quite large. Um, but it got there by us just kind of being disciplined and slowly compounding and focusing on the right stuff. I just want to touch one more thing on, on this idea of, you know, the tech monopolies. So not only, you know, are, are, is your investment thesis kind of saying, okay, we're flying a little bit under the radar. We're going to get to platforms in a second, but you have lived and breathed and part of your story around the $10 million being lit on fire story is you essentially encountered what happens with tech monopoly money as your direct competitor, right? And that was flow versus what, what many of us now know as Asana. Um, and, and this guy, you know, uh, Dustin Mo Moskowitz, who was able to, he, 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 what was that meeting like where he met with you and, and, kind of told you what, what the future would look like. Well, he was actually very friendly. I mean, Dustin is like a very nice, quiet spoken guy, despite being the billionaire co-founder of Facebook. Um, and we were basically just having a coffee. And I think, you know, the subtext was, I think he wanted us to join them. And you kind of said as much, you know, why don't you join us? And we're, as we kind of talked about what we were working on, you know, I was saying, I don't think we need to raise money. And why would you raise all this money? And he goes, well, you know, we're going to be able to do marketing and, uh, you know, expand dev and we're going to be very competitive with you. And I just didn't want to hear it. Right. I didn't understand competitive advantage. And, you know, I joked in that tweet that essentially it was the equivalent of Fiji saying we're going to invade the United States because we were in a hyper competitive space with massive R&D requirements. Um, where you had to buy almost all your customers via PPC and marketing. And we're doing it on a shoestring budget. I think I was spending maybe 800000 to a million dollars a year for most of that time. And so what ended up happening was we built a great product. Initially, that was a bit of a competitive advantage because you know they didn't have great designers and stuff. But over time, they figured that out. They outspent us. They became the dominant name. They became the most uh, integrated with. So, you know, other apps integrated uh, with their API. And before you knew it, when you compare Flow to Asana, they ticked a lot more boxes in the matrix and more people knew them and trusted them and more companies used them and standardized around them. And so, uh, you know, in many ways, we lost the battle. We still have, uh, you know, actually a you know good, profitable little business. But Based on what it could have been, I think it was a huge failure on my part to understand competitive advantage and you know that vent the venture dynamic. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna go to um, compete against venture folks, it's like and and you're gonna be bootstrapped. It's like you know going to a gunfight carrying a knife. It's just not going to be very effective. Uh, we all know how that one plays out. So um, yeah, no, that's a very sound advice there. So. There's a, a good um, kind of real deep dive on how tiny is run. This guy did like the operating manual for how, how tiny is run. Lots of really good insights in here. But one thing this guy says is, I don't know if this is by design, but it seems like Andrew has progressed from services to tools slash products to platforms 
communities and, and digital marketplaces. Do you see it that way? Or, or how do you think about your investment philosophy and the types of business models of these internet companies that, you know, that you've been focusing on as, you know, as time has changed and over many years you've been doing this? Well, I think the advantage that we have is that we're operators and so we know how hard businesses are. And so when we look at a business, we can usually say, you know, A, how founder dependent on this, or uh, sorry, how founder dependent is this? How hard is this to operate? How hard is this space? Um, you know, what are the what are the kind of competitive uh, forces or, you know, countervailing forces or whatever? Um, and then is this a space that is uh, growing or dying? Um, and, and, you know, sometimes it's, it's the actual business is kind of slowly dying, um, or, or slowly growing or, you know, whatever it is, but at the end of the day, we're betting on the trend and we're saying, you know, is this a business that we can own for 10 years? Um, and you know, why can we get our money back at the end of the day? And, you know, like Buffett, we kind of have evolved from loving cheap things to actually really being ready to pay up when we spot competitive advantage, um, which comes in so many forms on the internet. Um, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's very qualitative. Uh, I think a lot of investors are very quantitative and they look at businesses like spreadsheets. I think it's much more qualitative. Um, and it comes down to the fact that businesses at the end of the day are collections of people and people are complicated. And so there's a lot of assessments to do around that. Absolutely. And you were, you were talking about dribble, you know, the network effects, the stickiness of that business. Is that something which ha has been much harder to find that, that you're seeing these kind of community driven businesses where there's two sides to it of some sort or another? Is it just a matter of where you look? It's kind of industry or vertical dependent, or it's just it's really just all bespoke. Any any kind of trends you've seen um, change as it relates to that stickiness factor and how it manifests itself? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest question mark at this point is the crypto stuff, which I, honestly I'd largely dismissed. I I was quite interested in Bitcoin um, almost ten years ago, and I think it's quite fascinating as a technology. But we've been waiting for it to be fully baked, and I don't know if it is yet. But I think one of the really interesting things to think about. Uh, as a platform owner is, um, you know, for the first time ever um, with, with the idea of issuing crypto tokens and all this kind of stuff, you can create a community where the owner of the platform and the users are directly aligned. And what I mean by that is um, if you were an early driver on Uber, let's say that you were the, one of the first 10 drivers, you got paid $30 an hour, and that's the only way you benefited. Whereas Uber benefited massively from you being on the platform and they all made billions of dollars. And so I think um, with, with what's happening in crypto, there's going to be platforms that spring up where the early users have an incentive where they can get rich by playing a part in the community. And so, uh, you know, as the owners of Dribble, for example, we're thinking a lot about how we can uh, be defensive there because somebody could probably create a dribble competitor and normally let's let's say today someone starts a dribble competitor well i'd probably laugh right i'd say okay good luck getting all these users to come over um you know uh i don't know how you're going to convince um the top thousand designers in the world to go somewhere where there's nobody looking at their work the reason people go to dribble is they like the community that's already there there's a network effect um, and people uh, get massive exposure. You know, they have like millions of designers that check it daily. So why would they move over to this new platform? The difference would be that if they created a new dribble that's based on a crypto token, you can go to all these thousand designers and say, look, I'm going to give you this token. And as the platform becomes larger and larger, the token is going to become increasingly valuable. And so you can get rich along with us, the platform owners. And I think that is a big open question right now of whether or not the platform moats will continue to be the, um, you know, the, the kind of shark infested moat that they've been, or they become like a little puddle. Um, and I don't know, that's the big question mark for us. And we're really bashing our heads against this and, and thinking about it long and hard. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, what's your take on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think what you're saying there is, 
by by b- providing not not literal equity, but you know, if you if you broaden the conversation to seen to to say a you know a bigger debate in society is you know how does society more broadly come along for the ride of you know growth and equity versus you know just the in this in this instance it would be you know the founders and the early employees that get a lot of that literal equity but can crypto and altcoins and tokens and all these things help provide a more equitable environment so you have utility based tokens that now the initial users are just naturally going to amass a bunch of those and presumably as the rise of the platform uh, grows then those tokens will also uh, increase in value and you know is that a strong enough kind of monetary subsidy that it could help to attract um, or tip the scale of penetrating certain network effects on either the demand and or the supply side from some of these really, you know, winner take all type of communities. It's a fantastic question. What is to stop? Well, tech monopolies are a completely different story, but what would be to stop a dribble from uh, issuing its own coin and trying to get out in front of that? Or maybe that's exactly what you're considering, right? Well, this is exactly what we're thinking about. And, you know, we've looked at everything from NFTs, for example. And again, these are all things that there's a huge hype cycle around them right now. They're kind of digital beanie babies at this point, and I don't want to pay them too much attention. But we've contemplated, for example, um, you know, we've got the world's most creative designers. Uh, you know, I'm sure they'd want to make digital art and and sell it on the platform. Is that something we can do? And the beauty of a business like Dribble is it's what I call an airport business. And what I mean by that is it's a place where um, if you want to fly somewhere, you got to go to the airport, got to hang out there for at least an hour and uh, wait in the lobby before flying to your destination. And Dribble is a place where people naturally congregate. And if you want to congregate with the world's best designers, you go to Dribble. And so just like an airport, there's a whole bunch of different stalls and you can choose who to rent those to. You can give them to a taco shop, a massage parlor, a wine bar, whatever it is. And so on our platform, we can continue to roll out and add on you know, new revenue lines. And we've looked at NFTs, we've looked at issuing tokens, like partly as a defensive mechanism. I think the concern is that we could ruin the platform and piss a lot of people off by adding a financial incentive to it. I think right now people go to Dribble because they feel good, they wanna get feedback on their work, they wanna see what's trending and kind of find the new design um, uh, kind of like where, where design is going and stuff. And I think as soon as you start attaching monetary stuff and weird incentives to that, it can ruin a community. So we're, we want to be very, very thoughtful, but we're in a very privileged position to be able to add that kind of stuff if we want to. Yeah. I had, um, uh, another guy on the show somewhat recently founded a company called library and they have, um, a, a content platform, like a YouTube competitor called Odyssey. And so you can get the library coin. Their blockchain protocol allows you to basically create a YouTube clone. And Odyssey is their kind of vertical application, uh, you know, built on top of this protocol. And the library token helps to kind of power all of that and and all this kind of stuff. And it's a top 5,000 website in the United States. And, you know, they've raised $7 million. uh, And then they got subpoenaed by the SEC. Uh, because the SEC came after them and, and, and now it's spilled over into the public and we had him on the show to talk about it. Um, but, you know, the SEC accused him of, of profiting off of their coin. And then that's frozen their ability to raise money and all these kinds of things. So, well, this is, this is a question is what's the difference between a coin and a marketable security, right? So if I issue equity, you know, could I just issue equity to all my early, early, um, users? And the answer is yes, but the paperwork would just be a complete nightmare and it's not liquid. And, you know, it's just a total pain in the ass. I think the liquidity and the, the kind of decentralized trust is what's so interesting. The, the most interesting, um, startup I've seen that kind of embodies this new idea is Brain Trust. Have you seen Brain Trust? I'm uh, looking it up. So Brain Trust is basically Upwork, right? So you go to their website and it just looks like a better designed Upwork. And Upwork is basically 
uh, a marketplace for freelance work. So you can go on there and hire a developer or an assistant or you know whatever you need, kind of knowledge work. And you go to the braintrust.com website and it just says access the world's most talented freelancers, no middleman, no markups, no hassle. And I saw that and I went, well, how is there no middleman or markups? They must be charging fees. And what's really fascinating about this is that they aren't. So I started digging into this and essentially what they do is they issue tokens to everybody involved, right? So uh, when when a customer comes on, the uh, the people who match them to talent are given a token and then all the users or all the um, all the providers are also paid in this same token. And so the idea again is that you're aligning incentives amongst everybody and that by doing so you can essentially remove fees, right? So it's, it's just very, very interesting. And I don't know if this is going to work. Um, you know, it's a, it's a hard model, obviously doing supply and demand, but seeing stuff like this is quite interesting. Yeah. And I, I think also well, a couple of things. One, it's a very scary association the SEC made because they are essentially treating um, alt alternative coins as a marketable security. And that was the big kind of, whoa, uh, when, when we had uh, Jeremy on the show, um, even though they never did an ICO or anything like that, but that's a whole other topic for this. I think, yeah, if, if it's, if it's kind of inherently intertwined into what I would call that core transaction, right? Like, for that compensation workflow, um, if if you can use the the token or the coin as a just a seamless and 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 mechanism to provide that compensation back to the producer in this circumstance, you know, then I don't maybe what you're getting at is like if it feels tacky, you know, it's like Facebook putting ads on Facebook, you know, when when they are expanding to Ivy League schools, right? Um, it needs to be baked in as just like any product feature or product add on that it feels a part of the experience and it was destined for that use case. So I think maybe that's the silver bullet is if you can figure out a seamless way to weave it in, then the value prop, the value prop clicks and it doesn't detract from the product and the experience that users get when going. And you can hopefully deliver on the premise that, hey, we're going to have a more equ equitable future for everyone, whether you're a founder or employee um, or early user, we're all going to share in this upside. So, you know, maybe these guys uh, will will be able to thread that uh, thread that on through. But I think conceptually it makes sense with the caveat being if you are going up against a tech monopoly, then. You know, all uh, all exceptions and caveats now apply, and you're in a completely different battlefield um, than uh, than kind of like normal platform wars. Well, and I think the thing everyone needs to remember is all those platforms have the option to do the exact same thing, right? I, I think it's a feature, not a product, and that if there's dinosaur tech companies who can't uh, adapt with that, they might be disrupted. But at the end of the day. If you have the largest community of people in a certain area, or you have just a you know fire hose of traffic, or whatever it is, you can always layer this in. And especially if if you're inherently touching payments or 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 some kind of uh, you know something related to money anyway, then it can be you know a more seamless, more appropriate feature that fits um, as opposed to kind of standing out like a sore thumb. So. But I love that vision. You know, I never really thought about it that way, you know, on, on how crypto and altcoins and tokens can be that monetary differentiator um, for the whole community, which isn't the be all end all, but certainly could be a, a, a key differentiator um, in the early days. Well, the, the thing that made me register it was there's this thing called BitCloud. Have you heard of BitCloud? Yes. So, so basically what they do is they, they um, almost like a, a clone of Twitter. And the idea is that it's on the blockchain and you, you basically can bet on people. So you can buy people's coin, right? So I could buy Alex coin, you can buy Andrew coin. And as I get more followers, my coin is more valuable. And what they did is they scraped Twitter and they said, look, Andrew, if you come over here, um, you have $70,000 worth of BitClout 
Bitcoin. And I went, oh my God, well, because I have 150,000 followers on Twitter, they're going to give me all these tokens. And um, all I have to do is tweet it out, right? So I tweeted it out. I move over to this um, platform and I was like, wow, I have $70,000 worth of, you know, liquid cash kind of right now they're they're not allowing people to withdraw yet but you know if this keeps going probably we'll be able to withdraw and i didn't start using the platform um because you know it wasn't that relevant to me but i could see how attractive this would be if i was a top reddit user and some decentralized version of reddit came along and said hey andrew if you move over we're going to issue you a hundred thousand uh, token, a hundred thousand dollars worth of tokens in our new Reddit clone. I'm going to move over, and I'm going to have a really big incentive to try and get everyone I know, know to move over because the more people that buy in, the more valuable my tokens become. So, as an incentives problem, I think it's fascinating. Well, and it's like uh, what what Jay Z tried to do with Title. You know, he just didn't do it in a scalable way. Um, but right, that was the whole idea. Hey, if you're a key producer come on over and we're going to help, you know, bake you into some of the upside here. Well, and I think with NFTs, what will be interesting is not what it is right now, which is a virtual beanie babies, but I think it'll be the idea of creating something that is truly unique, like a song and then Spotify. I hope what will happen is that Spotify and other platforms will basically say, Oh, every song that we have is an NFT and that it's community owned or artist owned. Um, because if you think about it, imagine if Taylor Swift said, you know what, my next album, I'm not going to use Columbia Records. I'm going to go to my fans and I'm going to raise $20 million for an NFT. And that NFT is going to be my album. And then all my fans are going to own a chunk in my album. And you almost have like a publicly traded stock for her uh, album. And then as Spotify, uh, you know, plays it more and more and more, all the royalties flow to Taylor Swift, but they also flow to her fans and all the owners of the NFT. I think that is really interesting. And I think what's interesting about crypto is the idea of a market for everything, like a marketable security for almost every conceivable thing. But again, I think we're probably five or 10 years away from that actually being fully baked. And you know who is literally getting hives right now listening to this conversation? <laughs> The regulators, you know, the the prospect of 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 this um, new future <laughs> and this conversation, especially uh, if they're listening in. Yeah, they uh, they need to go have a couple drinks after this. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be impossible. It's going to be nailing jello to the wall. Right. There's just too many markets to regulate. Because that's, that's the real distinction is how is it different? How is BitCloud issuing me, uh, you know, $70,000 worth of their clout coin different from them issuing me, you know, stock? And it's in reality, it's it's privately tradable. It's public. It's really publicly tradable. There's a public uh, equity market. It just happens to be called a blockchain. I mean, it could be a great way to solve that age old question between, you know, creating a more equitable environment for society and how does everyone participate as opposed to a select few. And maybe this is the mechanism that decentralized, uh, um, mechanism to, to bring that about closing thoughts here, Andrew, what else is on the horizon? Um, you know, you, you, you take a, a long-term outlook like Buffett, you know, you kind of look a decade at a time as, as Ackman has, has advised besides, crypto and and uh, you know decentralized finance any any other kind of big mega trends that you're looking to to latch some barnacles onto well i think um you know one is at a time when everybody is going crazy and bidding stuff up and uh you know everyone's saying this time it's different i think it's important to take a breath and stay calm and sit on your hands and only do deals when logical so that's been um, you know, quite interesting, the frenzied market, trying to figure out how to be a market participant. And where we've settled is that at the end of the day, unless we see something that's a fat pitch, we're not going to swing. And we're really just focused on optimizing our existing businesses and building up cash and waiting for the right opportunities. Uh, we've got a couple quite interesting acquisitions that we're working on right now. Uh, I don't know if they'll close, but if they do, I'm really over the moon about them. Uh, can't talk about them yet, but um Otherwise, it's just really kind of waiting and sitting and trying at the same time, you know, being a skeptic, right? I'm very much a skeptic of this current craziness, 
but at the same time, trying not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. So still learning about crypto and seeing where the value might lie and how it could be disruptive to our businesses. So a lot of sitting on my hands and a lot of reading. Love that. And I, I couldn't agree with you more that, I mean, if you're, I mean, obviously it depends on the time horizon, but yeah, what, what we see going on with a lot of the public equities and what happens when you inject inject as much money as has been injected into the economy, the money system. Um, it's a lot of uh, irregular activity these days and being extra careful about what you get into and at what price you get into today certainly sounds like good advice to me. Pleasure having you on, Andrew. Such a, such a delight hearing some of your insights and what you're looking at and how you're thinking about it. Uh, we wish you the best. and. Thanks again for coming on. Thanks so much for having me, Alex. Talk to you soon. Okay. That was Andrew Wilkinson, a real treat. We'll talk to you later. That's it for us today on Winner Take All. Thank you.